excuse me, I'm also say a few words in Dutch because my family is visiting. Dus welkom in onze kerk. Uh, my brother and his family are here uh, with us for the week and uh, we have already been doing quite walking yesterday. We went to Lars and had great ice cream. So um, uh, if you are visiting too, maybe seeing family, you're very welcome with us today. And if you're joining us on the live stream, also I hope you will feel included in our service this morning. We are going to worship God. We worship the God who gathers us as his family. Like a, cho- a father loves to see his children around and get on with each other. This is how the, uh, the Lord is to us. And so we begin our service by singing, Jesus calls us here to meet him. Let us pray. God in heaven, we may call you Father as Jesus did. You have called and adopted us into your family, and now we are gathered here together in your name. From all walks of life, from all different stages of life, each with our own gifts, interests, and problems and opportunities. We gather as your assembled people, your family, your church. We come because you've called us. We come because you love us and want to spend time with us. You are always there wherever we go, but we don't always pay attention to you. You have called us for a purpose. You have a mission for us in this world. We are called not just to you, to be in relationship with you for our own sake, but also to be your image bearers in this world. Even though we are not worthy, you have called us and sanctified us and you equip us. Our lives have purpose because of your grace and call. And we give you thanks for this grace and for this call. We thank and praise you that you sent Jesus to make all this possible, to show us the way and to invite us into your family. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. 
but we also ask you for forgiveness for ignoring what is involved in this call for a lack of holiness, of seriousness. We are more concerned with what the world thinks of us than what you think of us. And we measure our own successes against the measures of the world instead of yours. Father, forgive us. And as we begin our sermon series in 1 Corinthians this morning, we pray that you will open our ears and our hearts, ready to hear what you have to say to us. And if it challenges or offends us, may we take time to sit with this challenge or offense. May we know what it is exactly that we need to hear today and give us your spirit to enable us to do what you would have us do. And let us now pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I was going to do a short all-age talk, and don't worry, I will translate as well, but seeing that the majority of the children are Dutch, I will address them just in a few sentences uh, in Dutch. I hope I'll not embarrass them, but you'll not know what they say anyway, so it's fine. Um, ik wilde even met jullie praten. Ik vroeg me af, als iemand boos op jou is, papa of mama, wat denk je daar dan van? Wat zeggen ze dan? Hm? Is niet zo leuk, hè? Of als de juf of de meester boos is op jou? Weet het niet, nee. Meestal als papa of mama boos is of als de juffrouw boos is of de meester. Dat betekent niet dat ze niet meer van jou houden. Die, die papa is een beetje boos, of niet? Wel. Maar juist omdat je vader en je moeder van je houden, zijn ze soms wel eens boos en willen ze dat je de volgende keer beter doet. Niet omdat ze je niet lief meer vinden, maar omdat ze het beste met je voor hebben. En het is eigenlijk hetzelfde met die juffrouw van meester. Die willen dat je wat nieuwe dingen leert en als je niet oplet of uh, niet goed met je klasgenootjes omgaat, dan kan er niemand leren. Maar... Het is eigenlijk een teken van liefde dat af en toe papa en mama boos zijn en misschien wel een preek houden van nou moet je eens even luisteren of misschien moet je wel even op de trap zitten. Maar het is een teken van liefde, want ze willen dat je, dat je opgroeit iemand die weet hoe, hoe je goed in het leven kan staan en het beste met je, die moet even op de trap, of niet? Ja. Yeah. <laughs> We gaan straks een brief lezen, dat zal je niet kunnen verstaan, maar dat is Paulus die schreef naar de gemeente in Korinthe. En die, heeft, die is eigenlijk ook heel boos op de mensen in de kerk. Want ze doen allemaal stoute dingen en ze maken ruzie en ze luisteren niet naar wat hij had gezegd toen hij erbij was. Maar hij doet het niet omdat hij niet van ze houdt, maar juist omdat hij van ze houdt. Wil hij deze brief schrijven en zorgen dat ze snappen hoe ze moeten leven als christenen. Right, summary. <laughs> you will get this in the sermon. So sometimes when parents um, scold or discipline their children, obviously it's not pleasant and you know, nobody likes to get told off and you might actually resist it uh, or a child might resist it. But it is because the parent loves the child that it goes through the bother <laughs> and the, the heartache of trying to get their attention and disciplining maybe by the naughty step or something else. If a parent didn't care, if you were never disciplined uh, and corrected, it would not be a sign of love, it would be a sign of neglect, really. Uh, and so I was just explaining to the boys that uh, we're going to read about the Apostle Paul, uh, who is quite cross with the congregation in Corinth, and we'll obviously learn more about that. But he's writing to them nearly from a parental concern for them, and he's quite strong with them. But he's doing it because he loves them and because he's been tasked by God to, to take them and to shape them 
uh, and it's coming from this place of love, which can sometimes be hard you know, to hear if people advise us or even disagree with us. It's to have that attitude of humility and understanding that maybe we need to open our ears and be open to that correction that's coming from a place of love. Right, we're going to sing a song. Um, obviously, all the songs are in English, but I'll see if you can find a tune. It's actually a Dutch tune of a little nursery song, which has got nothing to do with um, what we're going to be singing about. It's to do with a cat. Je moet, we gaan een liedje zingen. En uh, moet je straks, kan je thuis zeggen of je weet wat, het, wat de melodie was, of dat je dat liedje soms kent. Ja? Yeah? Well, they can tell me at home if they've picked it up. Ian knows it anyway. So we're going to sing, uh, Lord, I pray if today. As has now been uh, amply uh, announced, we're going to start a new sermon series on Paul's letters to the Corinthians. And as I've done uh, before, and you maybe recognize the poster that you've got in front of you, uh, I want to start the series by showing you the Bible Project kind of overview video of the whole book or the whole letter. Now, you have seen these things before, they do always go at quite a pace, but they're illustrated, um, and in this morning's email I have put a direct link to that video, if you just want to see it another time or another time later, then it, that might be uh, useful, because it's quite a lot to process, but don't panic, because we'll spend a few months <laughs> in this letter, so we'll unpack everything, but I think it's just a helpful way to get an overview uh, of this letter, so we'll We'll watch the Bible Project's video on 1 Corinthians. Yeah, hold on, I think the audio is coming through the speakers. I just need to fix that. It happens sometimes that it's going to the projectors, which isn't loud enough for you to hear. Ah, no, it's, you can't change it there. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to a church community that Paul knew really well. Corinth was a major port city in the ancient world and had lots of temples to Greek and Roman gods. It was a big economic center. And so Paul strategically came here as a missionary. He spent a year and a half there getting to know people, talking to them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of people became followers of Jesus and formed a church community. You can read about all of this in Acts chapter 18. 
So after a while, Paul moved on to start churches in other cities, and he started getting reports that things were not going well at all back at the church in Corinth. It was plagued by all kinds of problems, and that's why he wrote this letter. It's broken up into five main parts, along with a final greeting. And these five sections correspond to five main problems that Paul is addressing. And so the letter reads like a collection of short essays on different topics, but there are these core ideas that unite all of the pieces together. So here's what he does in each section. He describes the problem, but then he always responds to that problem with some part of the story of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus. And he shows how they're actually not living out what they say they believe. And so this letter is all about learning to think about every area of life through the lens of the gospel. So let's dive in and see how he does it. In chapters one through four, the problem is that there are these divisions in the church. There are some other teachers who had come through town since Paul left, a guy named Apollos and then Peter, and people had picked their favorite teacher and then became groupies around that leader and then started to talk bad and disrespect people who favored another leader or teacher. And so Paul, his response to this is kind of sarcastic and sharp. He says, you have to be kidding me, right? The church is not a popularity contest. The church is a community of people who are centered around Jesus. Its leaders and its teachers are simply servants of Jesus. So while you might prefer one leader more than another, it's not worth dividing over and certainly not speaking poorly about each other. The center of the church is Jesus and the good news about who he is and what he's done. In chapters five through seven, Paul addresses some problems related to sex. There were a number of people sleeping around in the church, one guy with his stepmother, a number of other people still worshiping at the local temples to greet gods and sleeping with the prostitutes who worked there. Not only that, but there were people in the church who were saying that this was all just fine. They said, hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace is bottomless, right? It's fine. Paul says it's not fine. And with the gospel in hand, he shows just how wrong-headed this kind of thinking is. He says, remember, first of all, Jesus died for your sins, including the ruin of broken relationships that's caused by sexual misconduct. And so if you're a Christian, Sexual integrity is one of the main ways that we respond to Jesus' love and grace. Paul also reminds them that just as Jesus was physically raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead, which means this. If your body is being redeemed by Jesus now and in the future, then what you do with your body matters. It matters a lot. And it's not yours to do whatever you want with. Paul's being super clear. Being a follower of Jesus involves no compromise when it comes to sexual integrity. In chapters 8 through 10, the issue is about food, but not just food preferences, like do you like or dislike a certain food. The issue the Corinthians were divided over is meat that came from animals sacrificed in the local temples to Greek and Roman gods. And there was a split between the Jewish and non-Jewish Christians about how to respond to this issue. And once again, Paul appeals to some core ideas from the gospel. He says, our allegiance, first and foremost, is to Jesus as Lord, not to any other gods. And so if you're in a situation where there's meat that's been dedicated to another god, and there are people around who might watch you and conclude, oh, look, hey, Christians worship Jesus, and they can worship other gods too. Paul says, if that's the scenario, don't eat the meat. Your loyalty is to Jesus, and you should love those people more than yourself and not mislead them. But Paul quickly qualifies this and says, listen, as Christians, we believe God is the creator of all things, including that animal. And the temple idols, we believe, are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there's no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions and you're hungry, eat up. You're free as a new human in Christ to follow your conscience in these kind of debatable matters. So what makes it okay in one situation to eat, but not in the other? The core principle is love. Love will deny itself and look out for the well-being of other people. And love, God's love, is at the core of the gospel. It's what Jesus did when he died for us. And so Paul says it's what Christians should do for other people. In chapters 11 through 14, Paul moves on and addresses problems in their weekly worship gathering. There were some people who were having really powerful spiritual experiences in the gathering. And so they would start praying out loud in unknown languages. 
there were other people who might start sharing a teaching or a word from God, and then someone would get up and interrupt them because they wanted to share. And it all was really chaotic, and it was distracting people, especially visitors, from hearing the gospel. So in these chapters, Paul helps them think, first of all, about the purpose of this gathering, to help them see what kind of behaviors are appropriate. He says the gathering is a place where God's spirit should be working through everybody and it should happen in a unified way. So he develops this cool metaphor about the church as a human body. It's one, but it has all these different parts and each part serves a unique and important role. So he goes on to name a whole bunch of things that the spirit does through all these different people, all for the building up of the church. That's a key phrase in these chapters. And Paul concludes that the highest value in the gathering should be a concept central to the gospel, God's love. And love is a key word in these chapters too. Love will compel each person in the gathering to use their role to serve and seek the well-being of others. So Paul applies all this to the Corinthians' problems. Some people think the purpose of the gathering is to have intense spiritual experiences or to get a chance to speak their mind. And Paul says, listen, I'm a big fan of powerful experiences of prayer, but if it distracts other people or freaks them out, I should stop it because I'm loving myself more than I'm loving those people. The gathering around Jesus should be orderly so everybody can learn and sing and worship and hear God speaking to them. The last problem Paul addresses is the issue of Jesus' resurrection and the future hope of Jesus' followers. There were some people in the church who were saying that the idea of resurrection is ridiculous and doesn't really matter to being a Christian. And Paul reacts to this big time. He begins by saying that the resurrection is an indispensable part of the gospel. We believe in it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive in a physical body after being publicly executed by the Romans. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Paul says, then his death was meaningless. We are all still lost in our sin and selfishness. We should just stop being Christians. Paul then shows in detail how the resurrection was Jesus' victory over death and evil, how it's a source of life and power for us now in the present, and how it's a promise of future hope for the whole world. It's because of the resurrection that we have a reason to be unified around Jesus. It's the reason we have motivation for sexual integrity. It's the source of power for loving other people more than ourselves. And ultimately, it's our hope for victory over death. And so, Paul concludes, we do believe Jesus was raised from the dead, which means this. The gospel is not just moral advice or a recipe for private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new reality. And that's what 1 Corinthians is all about, seeing every part of life through the lens of that gospel. There's always a lot to take in, so don't worry. We're going to come back to all these different subjects um, in depth over the coming <laughs> weeks and even months. So just thought it's a useful way to give you an overview and you're welcome to take the posters home with you, um, you know, for reference. We're going to sing, uh, I am the church, you are the church, which really makes the same point as one of Peter's or Paul's themes in this letter that we are the church together. So I am the church, you are the church. <laughs>
read for us the kind of opening verses to 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, which is where Paul greets the people of Corinth and introduces really the key themes. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and our brother, Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those who sacrifice sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his most holy word. I'm going to... No, I don't always have a title, but I thought I would do a title. Uh, so, Great Expectations. I hope uh, maybe that will apply to the sermon series, but definitely Paul had great expectations for the church in Corinth. These few verses that we've just heard read are just the introduction to his letter. Paul is trying to build a rapport here with the people who are receiving it, but it is clear there are lots of problems in Corinth. And if you've ever given maybe critical feedback to someone at work or, um, I don't know, just someone in your family or or a friend, usually you'll think very carefully about how you're going to begin (laughs) your talk and how you'll end it. You'll try to start on a positive uh, to kind of build rapport and confidence that people will hear what you have to say, even the difficult, challenging things. And you'll probably also try to end on a positive note as well. So here um, you have Paul trying to think up some good things and begin with some praise and encouragement at the start of his letter. You want to avoid that people just shut down if you launch in with the criticism, you know, the the ears get shut and, you're, and, and people just will, in their minds, start thinking of how they can defend themselves against what you've got to say. So Paul has to bring them in uh, so they're willing and open to hear what he needs to say to them. A parent needing to correct their child uh, might have a little preamble to their sermon. Uh, I know you can do this and you're better than this. And I'm saying this because I'm your mother and I love you and I want this or that for you. You try to build uh, some kind of a hearing for the criticism that is inevitably coming. And this is what Paul is doing in the few verses that we've just read here. He had been in Corinth, as we heard last week, when uh, Reverend Gray preached on the passage from Acts that he'd been in Corinth for a year and a half and he'd worked there as a tent maker alongside Priscilla and Aquila. And he first taught Jews in the temple or in the synagogue about Jesus, the Messiah. But then uh, when they were chucked out and resisted, he moved next door to the synagogue and and, um, based himself in the house of a sympathetic Jew. And then they basically started engaging with anyone who would hear it, uh, Gentiles mostly receptive at that point. Um, His work had borne fruit, and there was now a church in Corinth. 
And when I say church, I don't mean nice fancy building because these didn't come in until about three centuries later, but a group of people, of Christians, that acknowledged that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and Lord of the world, and they wanted to learn more together and praise Jesus. And they would regularly gather to, to study the scriptures and sing and pray together. However, this very young and mostly Gentile congregation had difficulties figuring out how to live as followers of Christ amongst their peers. There were conflicts and divisions, and Paul is now writing to them to try and address these issues. And really, when you read on, it's quite clear Paul is cross, and he sounds very much like a frustrated parent. However, like a parent, he cares enough for them to be frank. He could have just, you know, washed his hands off and moved on because he had plenty of other things to occupy himself with. He was trying to start churches in Ephesus when he writes. But he does care, and it may seem harsh in places, but he speaks with the passion of a parent that has great expectations of uh, their children. Or perhaps like a teacher or a pupil who, uh, or of the teacher of a pupil who can see they're kind of throwing away their chances and not making the most of the opportunities given, or not yeah, maybe falling in with the wrong sort, etc. And they just want the best for that pupil. Now I'm just going to briefly walk through some of the sentences, and we'll have them up on the screen, and then. Um, I'll just point out these kind of links to you that, that how, he's, how he's doing this. So he starts with saying, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ by the will of God and our brother Sostenus. Now, he doesn't normally, when he writes the other letters, he doesn't say, oh, I'm an apostle. But here in Corinth, he kind of makes the point that he is an apostle, that is somebody charged by Jesus himself to share the gospel that Jesus was Lord and that he was risen from the dead. And it's really a badge of authority here because in Corinth, as we have already heard in the video, there were other people had arrived and talked and preached the gospel and um, sometimes slightly different spins on it. And they didn't think Paul was all that impressive when he was speaking to them and they fancied you know, more impressive performance. But Paul here is kind of pulling ranks and saying, look, I am an apostle, you do need to hear. And it was by the will of God, you know, God's called me especially, uh, and you need to listen. The next verse says, um, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Paul emphasizes here that the church, the people of God, are made holy by God, that they are set aside for a special purpose. When we think of holy, we think usually of holier than thou, people who think themselves better than everyone else. It's not really the point of the Hebrew or the Greek concept in the Bible. It's that God sets aside people for, calls out people for a special purpose, and that is to show the whole world, the rest of the world, what God wants for humanity. So they're made in the image of God and the light of the world, not to be smug, annoying people, but to show God's intentions with everyone. But there is a lifestyle that should match this purpose, and then Paul will go into the practicalities of this call to holiness in greater detail in this letter. But it's just kind of dropped in here at the very start. And then uh, that second part, uh, just go back one, if you can. <clears throat> the second part of the sentence, uh, can you go back one? It says, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Because there were divisions in Corinth, here Paul is already kind of subtly underlining that it's not just about Corinth and the Christians there, but that they're part of a much bigger whole that Jesus calls a worldwide family, not just little sections of Christians who think they know best. 
And so even in this little sentence, he's already setting out that the unity that we confess is because Jesus, because God calls us into the one family and we all call on the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Then the next one. He goes on to say, um, you've been given, you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God confirming our testimony about Christ among you. And therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So here's a bit of the praise. Like, look at you. You've got all these spiritual gifts and you're so able and some of you can speak beautifully and you've got all these special experiences. But it's bordering on slightly, not cynical, but there is a a little undertone there because he will come back and talk about all the divisions in Corinth where everyone was bragging about their very special uh, spiritual gifts and they were, uh, they were really keen to get you know, great, fantastic, charismatic speakers and preachers, but all the while perhaps forgetting what all these gifts were for. So he is saying to them here, look, wonderful, you've got all these gifts and God has given you all of this. It's not about you, <laughs> it's about God and, you know, what are you going to do with it? So again, in a, in a positive light here, but there is already a hint of the criticism that will, will come. And then he concludes his introduction by saying, he, i.e. God, will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that really is Paul's hope um, and the basis of his great expectations for Corinth, and it should also be their hope, that it is God who will keep this fledgling, troubled congregation firm to the end. Maybe Paul was actually writing this just to reassure himself that it wouldn't all go to pot and fall apart. Um, but that ultimately it was in God's faithfulness that people needed to cling to, not their own achievements, not his own achievements as as apostle, nor the congregations, but it was based on the promises and the faithfulness of God. And I think if, um, yeah, both teachers and parents will recognize that need to kind of hand over sometimes that we can preach all we like, we can sermonize, we can correct, and yet there comes a point where you have to trust that it, the child will take what they have been given and at some point see the light and maybe return to it and make it, um, you know, that it will come to fruition in their lives, but ultimately that we have to hand it over to God, that God will bring these things to fruition in their lives. Just very briefly then, what is Corinthians to us? What use is it to us in the 21st century? And as we'll go through, some of the topics will feel quite current and others might feel really alien, like I don't know if you're worried about whether or not you should eat sacrificial meat uh, in the past week. So some things feel very strange, but I am quite confident that we can you know, find connections, particularly when it comes to the, the principles that Paul is pointing towards how we deal with these um, challenges in our lives. How do we apply the gospel? How do we live out the gospel in the 21st century? And that really, I hope, has um, given you some great uh, expectations as to reading uh, this letter together over the coming months. And I hope also that we remember that ultimately it's God and uh, we'll hear through Paul, encouraging us, correcting us even places that we are open to hear uh, when there are passages or topics that we find challenging and perhaps annoying even, that we stay open to try and hear the voice of a loving parent who wants to see us flourish as human beings and as his image bearers. We actually know that Paul's letter was followed by a visit, which went really badly. And then we have another letter to Corinthians, which is much more fractious than this one. The relationship between Paul and Corinth never really worked out again. 
which perhaps is a, a sad kind of realism about church life. But yet, the fact that we have this letter, these, both these letters that they've been, there may have been another one in between, that they, that they have come to us, they've been kept by the church, capital C, for passing on, shows that we do need to hear these things in whatever century, and we do need to live out as best we can the gospel. So today, when we hear God's voice, may we not harden our hearts, but be open to him. Amen. We're going to sing about that as one of the Psalms where God is portrayed as a, as a loving parent. Hymn 69, just as a father shows his love. Just by way of announcements, uh, this Friday the drop-in will be, the summer drop-in will be on uh, again. I was really busy last Friday, that was the first time I was back from holiday and it was great. And we even, some of the older children had a, had a go at the organ, uh, introduced to the various technicalities of it by Ian. So um, please continue to pray for the drop-in and for the contacts we make with families and carers and the children. And if you like noise and you want to come for a free snack then, uh, then, then do drop in as well yourself. Let us pray to God. God, our ever caring parent, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that you care enough to speak to us in love, with passion, with encouragement and correction. Help us remember that you speak to us so we will flourish as your children and as your image bearers in this world. We give thanks for parents, teachers and friends who will speak to us with love and frankness when it is needed, who will spar with us to clarify our thinking and our acting, who speak out when they are worried about us. Give us the humility and the ears to hear these views and concerns and to consider them carefully rather than dismiss them outright. We confess that as we grow up and age, we think we know it all and we find it hard to stand corrected. The world changes fast and sometimes we prefer to rely on our own experiences and understanding. Sometimes our pride stands in the way of taking sound advice. God, whatever our age, keep us open to new learning, as individuals, as your church. We give thanks for Jesus, our teacher, who humbled himself and practiced so perfectly what he preached. We give thanks for the Holy Spirit who guides our conscience, who helps us understand Jesus, 
and the Bible through changing times. We thank you for the community of the church where we may discover your will and call for our lives together. God, our caring parent, we pray for those who feel lost and lonely today, who do not have a friend or a parent or companion to guide and accompany them, who are overwhelmed at the choices and challenges ahead. God, be their caring parent. God, our calling parent, we pray for those who feel their lives has no purpose, who are trudging through each day as in a hamster wheel. God, may they hear your call and purpose for their lives and find joy in living it. God, our chiding parent, we pray for those who are misguided or gone down a dangerous path, whether in practice or in their thinking, who think they know it all and resist your correction. God, you hold your children to account, and it is your own family that are recipients of your correction. May we not be too proud or stubborn to hear it. Christ, our brother, we pray for your church in this land and throughout this world. May we be united in calling on your name, in relying on your grace and in obedience to your teaching. In the silence, we bring the prayers of our own heart to you. Lord, caring parent, you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. You're very welcome to stay behind after the blessing for coffee and, uh, or tea and a wee biscuit. We sing our final hymn, He is Lord, He is Lord. <coughs> Now may you go into this world ready to live out the gospel in the name of God Almighty, whose blessing is on us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. <laughs>